Hello and welcome to Food Tech 101 and the very first video in my brand new food room. Before we get started, just do me a quick favor. Click that subscribe button and hit that little bell icon so you'll be the first to know whenever I upload a new video. Okay, let's get to it. Today I'm going to make a very simple, very quick, very easy, classic British dessert. And it only has just three ingredients. I'm going to make shortbread. Now the great thing about shortbread is that it has just three ingredients. So in these coronavirus cupboards might be getting a little bit bare times and you want to have a little quick treat for yourself or your parent for your children. And this is a, a quick and easy one to do. All it really requires is some plain flour, some fat, solid fat, uh, I've got vegetable fat, we could use butter, and some sugar. And the great thing about this, it, something which is easy to remember how to make this is that it has a simple ratio, three, two, one. If any of you are old enough to remember bullseye, do three, two, one, three, two, one. Well, just think of shortbread as three, two, one. So you need three parts flour, two parts fat, and one part sugar. The flour I'm choosing to use for this particular recipe is wholemeal flour because it is more nutritious and we need to be keeping our bodies as nutritionally edified as possible, even when we're having treats. But you could also use uh, plain flour if that's all you have. I'm going to use 100 grams of fat. For this particular dish I'm using uh, solid vegetable fat. And then I'm going to use just 50 grams of sugar. Okay, let's get started. Now to make our shortbread, the method really couldn't be simpler. Uh, to begin with, the method I'm going to use today, although there are several ways you can do this, we could use a rubbing in method, which is where you use your fingertips to rub the fat in with the flour until it resembles fine breadcrumbs, or alternatively, put this one side, or alternatively, you can use the creaming method, which is what I'm going to use today. Now, the cream method is pretty much what is used to make most cakes, where we start off with our, our fat. This works better, the cream method, when the fat is slightly softened already. And we add our sugar. And all we do then is we squash, using the back of the spoon, squash the fat into the sugar until it's fully integrated. Now, this works a lot better when your fat is at room temperature. If you're using, for example, butter, and it's straight out of the fridge because it has no plasticity. That's uh, pliability, um, the ability to be shaped and molded with little pressure. Because there's no plasticity until it warms up, you'll find creaming very, very difficult and almost impossible. But with this particular vegetable fat, it's a bit softer than butter, so it's a little bit easier to work with. And what we should see when I finish is that this really yellow fat uh, should turn quite pale in colour and quite soft as what's happening is that the sugar is being dissolved into the fat. And I think we're done. Now what we have then is, you can see that the fat and the sugar have combined and have become quite soft and paler in color. Now to also double check that you've creamed successfully, one, tip, one good tip is to take a little touch between your fingers and feel it. And what you're feeling for is the grit. So when you first integrate the sugar and the fat, you feel a little bit of the grit is quite coarse. The more you cream it, the smoother it gets. Now you're not going to eliminate the, the feeling of the sugar altogether, but you'll start to feel between your fingers that it's quite smooth. That, that, that along with the colour indicates that we're ready for the next stage. Okay, we've creamed. Now, the final stage, which I told you was easy, is to just add our flour, mix it all together. Boom. In goes our flour. And then we mix the fat and the flour together. Now, unlike when you're making bread, we don't need uh, dishes, uh, short dishes like uh, short shortbread and pastry. And the main reason for that is that when you're making bread, 
and we need it. We need for a particular reason. Who can tell me the reason we need to knead bread? See if you can put the answer in the comments before I give the answer. There's a reason we need to knead bread. And that reason is to help develop something called gluten. There are two proteins in flour, one's called glutenin and one's called gliadin. Now when we knead, as in when we're making bread, we have the flour, the more we knead, the more it combines those two proteins together. One's like a little, like little string of balls, one's like a hook. And when they knit together, they make like what used to be an old fashioned telephone wire. And so they're stretchy. So when you have, say for example, a pizza dough, and you see people spinning a pizza dough around in their hands and it's all stretchy and pliable, um, that's because you've formed gluten, which makes it so when the bread rises, it can stretch and trap air. When you're making things like pastries or shortbread, we don't want it to stretch and trap air, we want it to be as dense and crumbly as possible. So fat, and shortbread in particular, shortbread gets its name because the fat coats the flour and prevents long gluten strands from forming. So they can only form short strands, hence short bread, hence the term shortening. Because the fat, using the methods that we're using, uh, and the quantity prevents the gluten strands from forming long strands, short strands, shortening, short bread. And that's where the name came, comes from. Also, the similar phrase is used in pastry when you get short crust pastry. Similar idea. So we've combined our fat and our flour together. Now, next stage is to uh, squash it all together using my hands. So now I'm just going to squeeze the mixture together. Now, because I've used wholemeal flour as opposed to plain white flour, wholemeal flour is a way of absorbing liquid a bit more than um, plain white flour would. So this should be very crumbly. Sometimes, uh, if it's too dry, we need to add maybe to half a teaspoonful of, of water, but I think we'll be, we'll be okay. As you can see, I'm not kneading. All I'm doing is squashing my mixture together. And you can see, it all comes together to form a dough. Now with this dough, we can do one of two things. We could do a number of things, one or two things. We can either um, carefully roll it out, punch out some shapes, uh, cookie shapes or biscuit shapes and put them on baking tray, put them in the oven, or, which is the second option which I'm gonna do today, we can put this into a flan dish and we'll bake it that way. Okay, so I've greased a flan dish. Uh, it's one with a loose bottom, which is quite good. It makes it easier to take out. I've greased it well as well. And now into that, I'm just going to, I'm just going to squash my short bread dough. Like I said before, you could have just uh, rolled this out and punched out some shapes if you preferred. But this is quite an easy way. It would have quite a nice effect. So you usually use your hands, what you wish, the back of a spoon, just to kind of level it out. Try and make sure that it's all the same thickness all the way over. Can anyone tell me in the comments why it's important that when making something like a cookie or something like a flan that, just, that should be flat, that it's the same consistency, the same thickness all the way. How does that make a difference? Tell me in the comments before I actually give the answer. So I'm just going to finish pressing this all the way around, making sure it's nice and flat and even. Now one of the main reasons why I want to make sure it's flat and even is that uh, when something is flat and even, it will bake at the same rate. If one part was higher, one part was high, thick, and the other part was thin, then while one part's still trying to bake, the other part potentially could be burning. So it's important that when making cookies or anything that's meant to be the same thickness all the way through, that it is the same thickness to ensure even cooking. Okay, so I've squashed it into my tin. Now I'm just gonna do a little bit of a, a decoration pattern by 
and then a pinch around the outsides just to form a little bit of a pattern. Next, I'm just going to score it into four which makes it much easier to break apart uh, into different shapes when it's baked. It's going to be a very crumbly mix, I'm just going to... I'm going to make it into eight. So I'm going to go half, an easier way to do it half, and go, go half again. And already, we can start to see it's got the classic look of most of the shortbreads that we're familiar with buying. Now, the good thing about this is that this is really, really, really easy to make, and you get a, a very impressive shot looking quality. And the final part is just for decoration using the fork. Yeah. So, there we have our shortbread. All I'm going to do now put it in the oven on a 180. That's some of the bran from the flour. On 180 for about 30 minutes. And just to show the contrast, I've done another shortbread using plain white flour. Okay, so we have our two shortbreads which are now out of the oven and just cooling. So in between now and when they cool and we actually taste them, I thought it might be a good idea if I show you how to do a sensory analysis. Now it's a big fancy word, but all it basically means is using our senses to evaluate how well a particular thing has worked. So whether or, not you're, whether or not you're one of my students or you're just a regular person viewing it from anywhere in the world, it's, good to, it's a good idea to be able to evaluate how well a particular practice has worked for you. So in this case, we've used um, a made shortbread using wholemeal flour and shortbread using plain flour. And we use our senses, hence the term sensory analysis, to be able to work out what uh, the real difference is, uh, which one we prefer with reasons why. So I'm going to talk you through how to do a sensory analysis. It's really quite simple. And to do that, we're going to use something called a star diagram. Now, the very first step in creating a sensory analysis is having, identifying what things we're going to evaluate. So as we have uh, the same product, all but one ingredient, I'm going to make a list of some of the things that are worth evaluating. So I'm going to put um, appearance, just make a note for myself. So appearance, that's one thing I want to evaluate. Um, that's using sight. I'm going to use aroma, that's uh, brackets, smell. As you can see, in going through the senses, we have five senses. So appearance, aroma, what else can we use to evaluate the difference between them? Um, we can use taste. Now, some of these things are clearly uh, very subjective, but that's what it is. You're using your own senses to evaluate how something's come out. So we've got appearance, aroma, taste, and the final one, we can make texture. So now around these, I'm gonna put our descriptors. So I'm gonna put appearance. Next, we've got aroma. So I'm gonna put aroma here. Next, I've got taste. And then finally, I have texture. But so these are the four things that I'm gonna be evaluating between my two products. Uh, next, I'm going to put a scale of one, two, five. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three. I'm going to have five being the highest, with one being the lowest. So, so far, so straightforward. So, I've got four sensory things to evaluate. I'm going to evaluate the appearance, the aroma, taste, and smell. The next thing we need to do is have is colour code. So we're going to have one colour for each product. So if I was going to do an, if I was doing an experiment or testing more than two products, I'd need more than two colours. But for now, I'm going to say red equals brown flower. I'm going to say green equals white okay so now we've got our basic table there next thing we need to do is test our product and here is a finished product we have our wholemeal flour and we have 
our white flour. Now judging your appearance is very difficult um, because it is entirely subjective. Now what, straight, what strikes you straight away is the fact that this is clearly more the colour we're familiar with with shortbread because shortbread by and large is made with white flour so obviously um, one's going to be darker than the other because we've used brown flour versus white, versus white flour so that part's obvious so it's very difficult to make um, a visual um, comparison without bias but because we're more familiar with seeing a shortbread in white flour I'm going to probably have to give the white flour one the slight higher ranking in terms of appearance because we're more familiar with, with seeing white products so for that reason and because of that bias I'm going to start ranking it so appearance I'm going to give the, the one with the white flour I'm going to give that a 5 out of 5 I'm going to put a little blob there and not far behind it because it, they are identical but for the fact that one's darker in colour just for the fact that we're not as familiar seeing the shortbread in brown, in, in brown flour I'm going to rank that one a 4 as you can see I have two marks on here now so next I'm going to go aroma now believe it or not they do actually smell quite different I wouldn't have thought that just the flour alone would have made such a big difference but they do smell quite different this is entirely subjective but the white one does smell a little bit better and I, I'm I'm naturally biased, biased towards whole grain foods but it does seem to smell slightly better I'm not quite sure if it's better or familiar but I'm gonna have to give it again slightly to the white product so aroma so I'm gonna go for white I'm gonna go five out of five so using my table again and for brown I'm gonna go four okay so for texture now I'm just gonna cut a piece So this is the wholemeal one and this is one with the white flour. Now texture wise, I'm going to break it to what it's like to break. Mm, interesting. Let's try the other one. Let's try this one now. Oh wow. Texture-wise, the one with the white flour is much, much lighter. Now, we expect this because um, wholemeal flour has a lot more in it than white flour, so it's nutritionally leagues ahead because it has additional fiber and bran, uh, bran and wheat germ, etc. However, it, is, it does make a much denser product. So, texture-wise, whereas the one with the white flour is very, very light, much more akin to what we're used to with, with shortbread, and with the bright flour, brown flour is quite dense. So in terms of when we're ranking it, we're going to be ranking it against what this product is supposed to be like. So based on what it's supposed to be like, um, I, again, I'm going to have to go white flour with this one. So it's not looking good for the brown flour at the moment, but it, it, we are doing it in a very analytical kind of way. Texture, so I'm going to have to go again. Uh, white flour, that's going to have to go five out of five with brown flour a four out of five so so far uh, in th out of the first three of the four categories the one with the white flour has been superior so the only one left now is to taste uh, and taste is a little bit like preference so we're saying so it's a bit like saying which one do I prefer the most it's entirely subjective so let's see from the final one uh, which one wins over all right so now into the taste part so I've got my brown product, I'm going to give that a taste. Mm, that's quite nice. Funnily enough, when you actually taste it, although it doesn't have the same lightness of, um, of the shortbread, it's still nice, it gives you something to chew on. It's, it's, I might have to judge it a little bit, now I've tasted it, the texture it's nuanced, it's, you can taste layers in it almost. It's really nice, I'm trying to another little piece. Mm. 
That's really nice. The flavors, it's interesting. Let me see. Let me, I'm gonna compare it now with the white one. This is the white flower one. Tastes a little bit. Call this one. When you taste it, it reinforces um, the difference in texture. So the white one is very light, quite uh, quite crumbly, but very very light. Much much lighter than the brown one. The brown one, however, um, when you're chewing it, it is a, it is denser, but it's not less enjoyable for its denseness. If you know what I mean. So although I've ranked, I've ranked it texture-wise um, a four out of five, I'm gonna have to adjust that slightly because now I've tasted them both. They're different. But one isn't nicer than one isn't doesn't have a better texture than the other, so I feel tempted to change that. But no, I'll leave it because I'm judging it based on not so much which texture do I prefer, but I guess which texture is most akin to what it's supposed to be like. So I'm gonna taste one more time. Taste. like the brown flower, it carries with it so much more interest, if you like, than the white flower one. The white flower one's kind of one dimensional, whereas the one with the brown flower, the white one. I'm gonna give the brown flower one a slight edge over the white. Now I would imagine that if 100 people tasted it, you might get quite different results, but they're both nice, so I like them both. But I think the brown flower just has, just bit, it's just a bit, <laughs> sounds, sounds crazy, but it's just a bit more interesting. There's more going on in the flavor. You can taste more in it. It's, uh, it's more detailed. It's, you can taste the other ingredients, the brand, and you can taste uh, the wheat germ in a way. You can, the, the flower itself has a, a more interesting flavor, which carries through to make a more interesting product. So, so for this one, I'm gonna give the brown, Five out of five, with the white, a four out of five. Let's see how this works out. So taste-wise, this is a very, very close one, in fact. But I'm gonna give a slight edge to the brown flower in the taste department. So brown flower, I'm gonna give a five out of 10. And very closely behind, I'm gonna put the white with four out of five, sorry, not out of 10. So there we have our data. Now what we do, we collect the lines, and then we have a picture which gives an indication of how our dish has ranked. So that's our green pattern. Now incidentally, the name Star Diagram gets its name from, because when you have, if you have lots of different things you're testing, it creates a, a star type shape. So that's kind of where the, where the name comes from. So now we're gonna connect with the red. So, there's our picture, our star diagram. That's what it's looking like at the moment. And it's a good, quick way of seeing which one seems to rank the highest. At the moment, clearly, it's, because it's quite a simple star diagram, you can see that the one with the white flower has come out on top. But let's put some actual data to this. So, what I'm gonna do is add up the numbers and see how it comes out. So for white flower, we have five, 10, 15, 90. For brown flower, we have four, eight, 12, 17. So we can see now empirically because of the test we've done that white flower has ranked higher than brown flower for a shortbread recipe. Now, we can also add a little bit more detail to this because you could then uh, say that um, taste is, is a more superior factor than aroma, texture, and appearance. Now, we could do that, but bearing in mind that taste uh, for both these characters were so similar, I'm gonna have to say that overall, um, for this particular product, that white flour would be more successful to use. That said, um, I'm still 
prone towards um, the brown flour because one factor that is not taken into consideration in a sensory test is the nutritional value. If we did a nutritional test, it's very likely then that the brown flour would, would out uh, point the white flour. But on this particular test, I was doing a sensory analysis, looking at texture, appearance, aroma and taste. The winner of this particular test, for our very simple British dessert of shortbread, where we're focusing on fats, is white flour. Once again, thanks for tuning in. Uh, don't forget to like, share and subscribe. Uh, and don't forget to hit that little bell icon so you'll never miss another video again. Just before I sign out, also you can now check out one of my brand new channels called The Green Reviewer, where I go around and I review vegetarian food. We've got like, I think I've checked out McDonald's and KFC to see what kind of vegetarian food they provide. So don't forget to nip over to our sister channel and check out that and subscribe there as well and tell your friends. Once again, as always, my name is Mr. Liebird, but you can call me sir. Of things we know.